We are going to talk now about oxidative stress and inflammation. This is a very real person I'm showing you a picture of right here. He gave us permission to use his picture and to tell his story. His name is Merlin. He was in his, oh, he was around 30 years old when he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. He is the bigger guy of the two. And uh, his glucose was 215. He, they don't remember what his cholesterol was, but they said he, it was alarmingly high. His doctor was alarmed at that. He had high blood pressure, and they put him on blood pressure medicines. He weighed 250 pounds, and they also prescribed metformin for him. They went home and decided they needed to do something about the problem. He was uh, living with his parents. He has Asperger's syndrome, which is a high-functioning form of autism. So he hadn't been able to live independently. But um, he and his parents began attending a Body for Believers program. And during that program, he was able to lose a little bit of weight. Uh, they came out of the program wondering what we are going to do next, and they picked up a paper and the front page article right at the bottom says reversing diabetes seminar coming to Jasper, Tennessee and they read all about it with intense interest and came and didn't miss a night. When Merlin left that night he took his food sample with him. He just took a second bowl and he stuck it on the top and uh, carried it out the door. We served it at the, uh, earlier in the program but uh, he took that out and says I don't eat the green stuff. Well, okay. We thought, well, that one's a wash. Uh, but they were back next week. He actually went home and decided he was going to give it a try. And uh, his results have been amazing. Um, now, this is Merlin today. He has lost um, 84 pounds he started doing the burst training. He began eating the foods. He said, I would put that green stuff in my mouth, and I would gag with every bite, but you said eat it, so I ate it. And he says, and I learned to like it. He said, that was amazing. I thought I'd never like the stuff. But he's eating it regularly now. He's become very active. The amazing thing about this story is not only is he off all blood pressure medications, and off all diabetes medications, his Asperger's is under better control. His father said, I have known him all his life, and I have never known this young man to be under such good control. What, what, did, what made the difference? I believe it was the high-nutrient diet that he put himself on, and uh, it's just, uh, he, he's just an inspiration to all of us. So what about oxidative stress? Well, I want to tell you a story to begin with. Um, my grandfather was a farmer. He was in medical school back in the early 1900s when he contracted tuberculosis from one of the patients. And at that point in time, we didn't have the common antibiotics we have today to treat it with. And he knew his only chance of survival was to take the outdoor cure. So he went to um, southern, I guess it was New Mexico, and uh, in the Albuquerque area, he began working as a um, truck wagon cook for what he learned later was a group of horse rustlers. So once he learned out who they were, he figured that uh, he, he had al also learned that the previous cook, the previous cooks, had mysteriously disappeared. And he felt like his uh, demise was on the future. So he escaped. By that time, his symptoms were under control. And uh, he ran for three days. Eventually, he ended up in northwest Arkansas. And uh, in northwest Arkansas, he uh, began truck farming, truck farmed the rest of his life. The outdoor cure, you had to go to a dry climate, stay there until the symptoms disappear. Then you have to spend the rest of your life in the out of doors. And he lived to be 84 years of age before he passed away. So he did very well. But when we would go to his farm, it was always such a highlight. Now, grandfather also had problems with tunnel vision and with uh, night blindness. 
And for those reasons, he did not drive. He wouldn't even drive a tractor. He farmed with a team of mules. And when we would go, we would go, with, when we would go there, we would oh, go, go out and gather eggs and stand there while the cows were milked or whatever else was going on. It was just so exciting to go to the farm, ride the hay wagon. Oh, my. And the highlight of the whole trip was always when he would t hitch the mules to that old wagon. Well, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to go back to the farm. And when I did, the house had burned. It was no longer there. It had been rebuilt. That house burned. A trailer had been moved in. The trailer had burned. There was nothing on the old farm except the road beds. And the well casing. And as I was walking around, we stumbled upon something. And it was an old wagon. My grandfather's wagon. Laying right where it had lain so many years ago when he parked it there. The wood was rotted out. There was just some old rusty tire irons and a few little pieces from the hitch that were laying in front of that. I found the springs for the seat. It was such a nostalgic moment for me. I still can hardly talk about it. Every time I tell this story, it's so emotional for me. I'm sorry. That's oxidation. In oxidative stress, when a person has diabetes and your blood sugar and your insulin levels get out of control. You, it actually overwhelms the body's ability to deal with free radicals and you develop something we call oxidative stress. You begin rusting out at five times the rate of the general population. And if you're not treated, you will die 10 years ahead of the general population. So it's a very serious thing that happens here when oxidative stress is, uh, happens in people with diabetes. So we need to know what we can do about it. Oxidation is a chemical reaction where oxygen interacts with substances, and examples of that will be things like fire or the browning of an apple or rust or copper turning green. It involves the loss of an electron on one hand, and then the opposite is reduction, where it's gaining an electron. So um, it happens in balance. We call it an oxidation reduction reaction or a redox reaction. So it sort of goes like this. This is a free radical. The, it, it's, a, it's a molecule or an atom. It has a nucleus. And then electrons circulate around it in, uh, in orbits, much like what a solar system is like. But occasionally, the, the, these electrons like to pair up. And occasionally, a molecule will lose an electron. So this molecule has lost an electron, and it has just become a free radical. Now, um, free radicals contain an electrical charge to them. And everything they bump into, it will create a burn. So uh, when, when it bumps into another molecule, it steals an electron from that other molecule, but it creates a burn. And we can actually see these burns on scanning electron micrographs when we look at the furnaces that are inside your cell that I was talking about. And uh, eat, eat, here, here's, here's uh, what we call a free radical cascade. Now it starts out with a molecule that is a free radical. And because he's missing an electron, he's got that charge, and he'll bump into the next molecule, and he steals an electron from it. That makes him into a free radical. And so he bumps into the next molecule, and that turns him into a free radical. And this cascade just repeats itself over and over again. What that results into is something that we call DNA damage. 
Now, your DNA is in the nucleus of every cell. DNA carries the whole transcription code in your body. And uh, it's very important that we be able to preserve this as well as possible. But these free radicals cause damage there, and that damage will result in things like genetic mutations, cancers, a variety of other disorders, and uh, that's why it's so dangerous. Here is a model of a cell. You can see the nucleus of the cell in the middle, and then there's lots of little orange, reddish orange objects all around here. Those are the furnaces I was talking about. They have a scientific name. We call them mitochondria. And this is actually a cross-sectional view, electron micrograph, of a mitochondria. That is where all the sugar is burned in your cell. And that's where the, the majority of these free radicals will, will be present at. So here's a free radical, and in order to s deal with the free radical, we need something that's called an antioxidant. And an antioxidant is a very similar type molecule, but it just contains an extra electron or two or three in its outer shell. And it can give up one of those electrons without becoming a free radical itself. So here we see that happening. Antioxidant has given up a free radical. Free radical is no longer toxic. So the free radical uh, cascade has stopped. So oxidative stress, the body is flooded with free radicals. And an antioxidant defense system can no longer neutralize them. You have an antioxidant defense system in your body. Uh, it's, uh, it, it makes a lot of substances to help deal with free radicals under normal condition. Normal metabolism creates free radicals. I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, these free radicals result in inflammation, and that pay, plays a pivotal role in the development of diabetes and diabetes complications. Things like neuropathy pain, cardiovascular disease, kidneys, kidney disease, blindness are all driven by free, uh, the, uh, this oxidative stress. And it causes premature aging and cancers and other things as well. So, where do free radicals come from? Well, some of them we make in our body. They are the byproduct of metabolism. You'll see over here is the mitochondrium right there, the, the furnace. And that's where most of these are made in your body. But because you have an antioxidant defense system, when you burn the free radicals, you also have chemicals that the body will make to help you deal with the free radicals. The problem is when we get more free radicals than we have the antioxidants. You can think of these free radicals, by the way, as exhaust from the furnace. When you have a lot of fuel available to burn in your furnace, it's like the body gets real sloppy about burning them. And so it gives off a lot of smoke. Those combinations are caused because of high fat intake and high fructose in in intake. You put those two combinations together, you're going to have a lot of smoke given off. A lot of free radicals are going to be formed. Okay? If you have um, less energy available to be burned, it's going to burn that energy very efficiently. And therefore, you're going to have very few free radicals that are given off. So for that reason, fasting, or a gentleman back here in an earlier session asked about fasting. Fasting could be very beneficial because it would help hold that down and you would have less problems with uh, free radical formation. Avoid snacking. Most of us are in a post perandial state all the time. What do I mean by that? That means we are in a post-meal state all the time. We get up in the morning, we eat breakfast, we go to work and we have a, uh, a snack, then we eat lunch, and then we have a mid-afternoon snack, and then we have another snack, and then we have supper or dinner, and then we have another snack before we go to bed. We're continually in a post-meal state, which means we have a lot of free radical formation just from the lifestyle that we're living. So, benefits on eating three regular meals a day as well. Okay, other things. 
oh, excuse me, we have, uh, we have smoking. There's 4,700 free radicals, different kinds, that are given off with every cigarette you smoke. But there's about 100 trillion if you're counting the numbers. So there's an awful lot of molecules that you poison your body with. If, you're, if you have diabetes and you're smoking, first thing I recommend you do is stop smoking, period. Okay? Ionizing radiation. You go to the doctor and have procedures done. A lot of patients go into the doctors with a preconceived notion of what they need. I need to go to the doctor and get an antibiotic. Do you really? I need to go to the doctor and have an x-ray. So you go to the doctor, I need to have an x-ray. Well, you're exposing yourself to ionizing radiation. There's no deformity. You have all kinds of use of your muscles. You walk in, albeit you hobbled. You had some soft tissue injury maybe, but did you really need the x-ray? You need to think about these things because that is one of the sources of radiation. One CAT scan will, you know, if you had like an abdominal CT, abdominal CAT scan, You've just exposed yourself to one year of the amount of radiation you would normally get from your environment. But if you have an abdominal CAT scan with contrast, you've just exposed yourself to seven years' worth. So these, these things really do add up. So don't run to get an x-ray every time you uh, get a little bump. Think about it. Air pollution is another source, and it's actually a much bigger source than many of us have thought. Some of the experts tell us that air, from air pollution, even though the air no longer looks polluted, there are a lot of pollutants there. We breathe them in. That goes directly into our circulation. It has an impact on our body and on our metabolism. And they, some of the experts say that air pollution accounts for as much as 300 cigarettes a day. So if that's the case, and then you're smoking on top of it, hey, we got a problem. We got a problem. We need to think about these things. So find fresh air. Um, be willing to clean up your own environment as well, because a lot of us do our own personal air pollution. So let's think about that. Ultraviolet light is another source of free radicals. Some of those things we can't do a lot about. Uh, over, uh, I would certainly avoid overexposure you know, such as causes a lot of burns and things of that nature because that is uh, caused because of the ultraviolet light and your body has to heal the damage. And then finally we have inflammation. Inflammation is a very important thing. If you have diabetes and you're not able to get your blood sugars under control, it may be because you have inflammation in your body. Could be even something as simple as periodontal disease. You know how when you floss, your uh, sometimes your mouth will bleed? That's because you have little ulcers between the, the gums and the tooth. And for some people, their, their, their blood sugars are out of control. They can't get the blood sugars back down. It may be something as simple as you need to be flossing after you eat. People that floss, by the way, live two years longer than people that don't floss. Is it just because of the flossing? I don't know. Is it just because if they floss, they take better care of their health? Maybe that has something to do with it, but some amazing numbers there as well. There are other sources of inflammation, many other sources of inflammation. So let's go down through a few of them here. We get a lot of dietary toxins and uh, free radicals from the food we eat. Processed meats tops the list. They are prepared, they're very high fat, those fats generate free radicals, especially when they're heated under high heat, and a lot of people fry their meats. So, uh, you know, I recommend that you stay away from that. Um, they also have a lot of additives in them, nitrates and other things that are, uh, are free radicals on their own right. So uh, they, it's wise to stay away from those. There's refined grains, sweets, Added fats like hydrogenated uh, fats and vegetable oils, all of these things we need to try to limit because, you know, when, when, when you make a vegetable oil, take, for instance, canola oil, supposed to be one of the good fats, right? They heat it up to 1,200 degrees. They, put, they, they add lots of acids to it and high pressure. And uh, ultimately, they come down and they purify it and they distill it down and you have an oil, which normally you wouldn't be able to get. 
Is it helpful for you? When you heat them to high heats like that, it changes the nature of the molecule. When you eat the fats without them being high heat, uh, heated to those high temperatures, then they are much better for you. Um, we have things like coffee and alcohol that uh, are sources of free radicals, also herbicides and food additives. But then we can get a lot of free radicals from our environment. Things like, for instance, bisphenol A. Now that's an additive, it's used in plastics and epoxy coatings. We use a lot of plastics in our environment, do we not? We've even gotten to where we drink our water out of plastics. But in the process, we're also uh, exposing ourselves to some of these things. Then pesticides are another thing. Uh, people ask me about eating organic. You know, uh, if, you, if you simply make the change from the standard American lifestyle, fried foods, fast foods, processed foods, over to where you're eating whole foods, that God created, you will make such an improvement in your health. That's the first step I want you to take. Just make the transition from processed to whole and, nat whole and natural. You'll be much healthier for it. You'll improve your health by about 75% or better uh, from making that change. Then if you want to go to the next step, then you can become concerned about uh, eliminating the pesticides from your, from your diet. Learn to grow your own foods. You need the exercise. All of us need the exercise. So anyway, and then there's phthalates, plasticizers. These things are, are readily available, available in our environment. It will make plastics real flexible. So they add it to plastics when they're making it. Uh, medications. They coat your pills with phthalates so they will swallow and go down easy. And yes, it's a source of free radicals. Uh, flame retardants are in just about everything. They're in the fabrics that cover furnitures and draperies, in the carpets. Uh, you know, it's just we add it to all kinds of building materials, and yet they are, uh, they are sources of free radicals. Then you can have micronutrient deficiencies. In the absence of adequate magnesium, uh, your body will start producing a large quantity of free radicals. And vitamin D is also very important as well. People that have adequate levels of vitamin D will uh, have, a, have much better health and they will form less free radicals as well. Chronic stress is another thing and it doesn't matter what kind of stress this is. It could be psychological stress, it can be emotional stress, it can be physical stress, but stress impacts the way our body metabolism works. So you need to have a good way of de-stressing at the end of the day. Dr. Herman Johnson wrote the uh, first known stress reduction seminar. And he was, uh, he was a good friend of mine from a few years back. He said, uh, of all the things we know to control stress, one stands out way and above all the others. And that's a walk with somebody at the end of a day. I thought that was amazing. A walk with somebody at the end of a day. That's what God wanted for you and me, was it not? To walk with us at the end of the day. Whew. Then altered gut microbiota. This may be because you were fed uh, um, formula as a baby. Changes your biome. Maybe that simple. It may be because of things that you're eating, the poor diet. Or it could be because you've used antibiotics. But uh, anyway... And then a sedentary lifestyle. When we're couch potatoes, our bodies just don't make the same chemicals on the inside that they make when we're up and we're active. And uh, it, it's like when we exercise, we activate our antioxidant defense system. So the body goes to work and it starts bringing all these other things back down into place. So when I tell you as people who have diabetes that you need to uh, you need to exercise. I'm not saying it just to burn calories. I'm saying it for multiple reasons. But one of the reasons is to help you deal with this oxidative stress problem. When you can bring that inflammation back down, then your diabetes is going to go away. And then finally, there's obesity. And this is a big thing because as a person becomes obese, those fat cells in your body give off chemicals which actually will tear down the body cells, destroy body cells. 
It's like that we have a mechanism to keep us the appropriate size that we're supposed to be. And as long as everything operates fine, if we start getting a little too heavy, it knocks down a few cells, they go away. But when we get metabolism out of balance, then that doesn't work right anymore. And we start holding on to what we have. One of the reasons people lose so much weight so rapidly by lifestyle change is not because they're eating less. In fact, I don't put restrictions on what they eat. I help them choose the right foods. And then they begin losing weight spontaneously. I had one lady, she sat there, this was our three-month follow-up to meeting, and she said, yeah, I lost 24 pounds, but I didn't do anything. Oh, yes, you did. No, I didn't do anything, she said. But you changed your lifestyle. She said, yeah, but I didn't do anything. Well, you, you, you laugh, but it, it, it's true. You know what she was meaning. She was meaning I didn't starve myself. I didn't get out and do all that back-breaking exercise or work or work out in the gym. I didn't do anything to lose this weight. It just came off magically. So that's what I hope for you. I hope you will be able to make those changes and make them come off. You know, we've known that there is a big uh, connection between inflammation and diabetes for well more than 100 years now. It was in 1876 that a physician actually published a, a report saying he had been able to make the symptoms of diabetes completely go away with high doses of salicylates. Salicylates are a family of drugs, and you're probably most common, I mean, most acquainted with one called aspirin. Yes, ma'am, aspirin. But, you know, we are not, that, that's fallen out of favor now. And the reason it's fallen out of favor is you can live, on the one hand, with diabetes. But if you have a GI bleed from the aspirin, because aspirin thins your blood, if you have a GI bleed from aspirin, you're likely to die from that. So your doctor would rather you suffer with diabetes than die from aspirin overdose and be diabetes free. So, so we've known about this for a long time. But, um, you know, the problem with inflammation actually begins in the fat cells with mitochondrial dysfunction. And uh, you have oxidative stress that sets up, and so free radicals are formed. And those free radicals are ir irritants. And it causes an inflammatory response. Uh, if you have inflammation in the fat tissue, that causes insulin resistance. If you have inflammation in the, in the brain, that causes something we call leptin resistance that we haven't talked about yet. And if we have inflammation of the gut, that causes leptin resistance and insulin resistance. So, inflammatory diseases, of course, topping the list here, is type 2 diabetes, but there are many other diseases that are caused by inflammation. And if you're experiencing diabetes, the chances are that many of you may experience some of these other inflammatory diseases as well. Diseases like coronary artery disease. In fact, 68% of people with a diagnosis of diabetes will die from coronary artery disease, and more than 88% of them have coronary artery disease. There's rheumatoid arthritis. There's osteoarthritis. There's Crohn's disease. There's asthma. There's chronic pain. You have high blood pressure, cancer. Do you know even the visible signs of aging we are now attributing to oxidative, oxidative stress? There's a certain amount of that we just can't get away from. But the more a person can keep themselves from being exposed to sources of oxidation, the better their outcomes are going to be. For instance, take, take somebody that's a heavy smoker. What does their skin look like at 50 years of age? It'll often be, be deeply wrinkled and checked. That's because of the oxidative stress problem. She's constantly taking all these free radicals into her body. And instead of having beautiful skin of a gorgeous woman, at 50 years of age, she's all checked and wrinkled and looks many years older than what she is. So uh, that, that, that this really does have a, an impact here. Alzheimer's disease, actually, uh, 
some, they, uh, some of the experts are saying that Alzheimer's disease can actually uh, respond, some of them can actually respond to reversal type programs. I have not personally seen that, but I am anxious to know. So I, I, I'm also anxious to know, by the way, while we're talking about it, I'm anxious to know about your experiences. If you go home and apply some of these principles, I would love to receive an email from you sometime in the future. You can email, email me at GrundyRDS um, at gmail.com. Gmail.com. But Alzheimer's disease, peptic ulcer disease, and acid reflux disease, all of these things are part of a similar uh, syndrome. So where do we get antioxidants from? Well, actually, there's a variety of sources. And since we have talked about foods so much, I googled foods, top 100 antioxidant foods. And I want you to just look at this list as we go down. Cloves is at the very top. It's sort of an irritant type spice, but it, it is high in antioxidant. Look, look down there at number um, five. No, no, not five, six. Turmeric. That is the most studied bot botanical in the world, over 5,000-something studies done on this pot particular botanical alone because it's such a powerful antioxidant. Some people will use that to relieve pain. Not because it's an analgesic, that means a painkiller, but because it is so uh, high. So let's just read down the list and see what we see. The numbers out to the side, by the way, so you understand those, are called an auric value. Auric stands for oxygen, oxygen radical absorbance capacity. And so it means it's basically this is capable of, re of uh, neutralizing this much. So these numbers are extremely high when you see 314,000 or 240,000, extremely high. They're like way off the charts. So uh, anyway, and the lower you go down the list, the, 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 less, the, the lower those numbers will become. But look at some of these foods. There's things like, I don't know most of these, I don't know even know how to pronounce that. Cocoa powder, I can pronounce that. What about thyme, margarine? But you're not going to eat a whole lot of these, are you? You're just going to eat little bits and tiny pieces of them. Uh, chili powder, rice bran. I can go for the chocolate. Hey, here's, here's pecans. Or um, Looking on down, we have elderberries, walnuts. I can do those. I can live on that. Pears, uh, artichokes, uh, kidney beans, black beans, pink beans, pistachio nuts. Oh, I love these foods. Lentils, apples, garlic, uh, blueberries. Prunes, lemon, uh, lemon, I mean, lemon balm, I don't know about that. Soy leaves, yes, we can do some of those. And as we go down, I see more that I know. Raisins and apples and strawberries and peanut butter, cherries, figs, cap cabbage and broccoli, raisins, blueberries, guava, lettuce, Concord juice, uh, Concord grape juice, etc. I just have one question for you. Where's the beef? And you see, the truth is that these high antioxidant foods don't come from our meat supply. They come from the plants. Therefore, we need to increase the amount of plants in our diet.